Femi, you're amazing. Uh, and uh, thanks uh, so much for EAT, Gunhild, and uh, everybody. This is a fantastic initiative. It's a complicated agenda. This is the uh, SDG agenda as it stands right now. It's not simple, and uh, we'd like to make it simple. It would be good if we could say, why don't we focus on just a couple of things? Isn't this the most important thing we should do? Isn't it a big mistake to take on uh, climate and farming and health and education and water and all this stuff? And of course, the answer is yes. I mean, who could uh, think that uh, in such a difficult, complicated world, we'd ever be able to, to do this? And maybe we won't be. So why so complicated? Maybe the right place to start is here in Stockholm 43 years ago. Because 43 years ago, there was a really good conference on environment and development. It was actually the world's uh, beacon call to this problem that we have that our economy is going to run headlong into our environment. And the message went out from here for the first time. And if we had taken heed 43 years ago, we'd probably have a lot simpler agenda right now. In fact, it's probably true to say if the world were more like Norway and Sweden, and I'll add Denmark in there also, uh, we'd probably have uh, you know, maybe two SDGs left to do, and they'd be pretty minor ones because the world would have solved its problems. So do not be fooled by your rationality. Do not be fooled by your commitment. Do not be fooled by your deep decency, because the rest of the world's nothing like this. <laughs> That's our problem. No, it's really true. The, the problem is the world is extremely complicated. 43 years ago, the idea of merging environment and development was put on the agenda. And 28 years ago, one of my heroes, I think a uh, hero of all of us, uh, Dr. Gru Harlem Brundtland, uh, put forward the proposition uh, that sustainable development was the way to reconcile all of that. And I thought, I remember I was already teaching, I thought that's a pretty cool idea. I, I like that. Uh, and then in 1992, 23 years ago, the world met in Rio at the Earth Summit. And that was really, really a great summit, if you can imagine. Three big treaties came out of that summit. And if you want to know how the world has changed, all three treaties were signed by an American president and it was a Republican president named Bush. Come on! <laughs> Maybe if you're not American, you can't understand all of the uh, absolute remarkable uh, aspect of that, but it's nearly unbelievable. It's a little bit like Rod Serling in the Twilight Zone, <laughs> that he would come out and tell you when President Bush signed the treaties in the Twilight Zone. Uh, because then we went into a kind of Twilight Zone 23 years ago, and again, we lost a generation. And the thing that's really interesting, because I'm an economist, I can tell you this, I think, with some, uh, I hope, credibility, but, uh, or maybe a, a little bit of authority, but I think it's an accurate statement. The world economy works pretty well at producing economic growth. And it's gotten better and better at it because more and more countries have kind of unlocked the key to growth and because the colonial age ended and more countries could do their thing to unlock growth. So during all this period from 1972 onward, then 1992 onward, we weren't standing still. In fact, there was great human progress in a lot of ways. And poverty came down and the world economy grew and the growth of the world economy has been between 3 and 4% per year, which means a doubling every generation. That's really great 
compared to the alternative. And uh, who was saying Manchester has a bad name? Manchester made the modern world, so Manchester doesn't have a bad name. It's just that once you're told, if you continue straight ahead and really continue straight ahead, you will go over the cliff, then you should start thinking about turning the wheel. And it's been 43 years, and we haven't actually turned the wheel yet. The car goes pretty well, but we're on a mountain pass. That's our problem. And that's why we have such a complicated agenda, not because it's so great to have to worry about marine ecosystems, SDG 14 terrestrial ecosystems, SDG 15 climate change, SDG 13 sustainable development, consumption and production, SDG 12 sustainable agriculture. I actually memorized these already, <laughs> so I'm very proud, but I don't hold me to uh, doing them in order. But in any event, we have them all because we have trouble on all these fronts challenges. Now, one other thing that's really stupid, it is stupid, and it's the fundamental truth of all of this, is if we could get attention worldwide to this, serious attention, not we'll have a meeting attention, but serious attention, and we would put some modest amount of our resources to bear on this, and I'll define that as under 3% of our global GDP. All of these issues are solvable, not simple, but solvable. Now, 3% of our global output is $3 trillion a year, so it's not nothing, but it also shows how big the world economy is. I beg, I crawl, I cry for a million here or there for something. So raising three trillion is not the easiest thing in the world to do. But it is 3% of our world production. And if we cared about the planet being sustainable, poor kids not dying of disease, everybody getting a decent education so that we didn't have a wrecked world, not wrecking the oceans, not wrecking the biodiversity and the sixth extinction and so forth, we can utterly, completely, totally afford it. That's the bottom line. So basically, we're here to get attention. Attention of the global consciousness to say this is really important. And it means you. You, if you're a CEO of a big company, you, if you're one of the 1,826 people on the billionaires list, you, if you're a public official, you, if you're an average citizen that actually goes to vote also, or, as everybody does, cares about their children, this is important. That's our biggest challenge I've come to understand. I find my field a little bit silly in this, spending all this time and effort, about 3% of income, seems like there should be something more interesting to do. But it turns out to be quite hard. But maybe the challenge isn't fundamentally an economic challenge. Fundamentally, it does seem to be a psychological challenge. It seems to be an ethical challenge, a moral challenge. But all the time that we try to figure out what kind of challenge it actually is, the world economy continues, and the profit motive is so powerful, it's really amazing. This is why economists exist, I guess, because that's their theme. And it really is true. It's very, very powerful, and the world economy continues to grow. And then we act in a completely contradictory, irrational, illogical way for long, long, long periods of time. You know, I'll give you an example. President Obama really does care about climate change. It's one of his legacy issues. He knows it's serious, it's real, it's one of the most important issues that he's going to face, that he has faced as president. He has a terrible Congress just in the pocket of big oil. If you want to understand it, how can 
the U.S. Congress be so reckless in its behavior? It's simple. Just this. That's all it is. Somebody pays money and funds somebody else's campaign. Don't think about anything more complicated. They're not as stupid as they look, those congressmen. <laughs> They're just on the take because that's how they stay in office, and that's their job. Okay, so President Obama wants to do something. I have no doubt about it. Then last week, the U.S. government approves Arctic drilling. Well, there's complete overwhelming evidence if you can do arithmetic, which is that Arctic drilling is not a good idea because it's not consistent with climate safety. And so you'd kind of go, duh. What, what, where'd that come from? And that's how it works. As many meetings, as hard as we have to move things forward, other than the line that's basically driven by a political economic system that's a juggernaut, is very, very hard. So to deflect this system that we have, which is a worldwide system, it's built on global corporate business, it's very powerful, very effective, the most dynamic economic system imaginable. But to deflect it so that you don't go right over the cliff turns out to be an incredibly difficult thing. And we've been trying now for 43 years. And today you have the negotiators in Bonn, and I'm getting messages every hour, oh, this is so difficult. Uh, this one's arguing this, this one's arguing that. So, that's 23 years since the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed. And it's 21 years since it was ratified, and we still do not have an agreement on how to implement the treaty. And in the meantime, the CO2 in the atmosphere has reached 400 ppm, and we're just on a path to 4 or 5 or 6 degrees C. In other words, a disaster, as uh, John Schellenhuber told you so powerfully this morning. I wasn't there, I was stuck in some turbulent weather uh, in a delayed flight, but I've heard John uh, tell the story and it's absolutely compelling, so I know what he did tell you. Now, the agenda for EAT is one of the three or four great complex problems that we face in this sustainable development agenda. Why? One of them is getting out of fossil fuels. That's big headline. If we don't get out of fossil fuels, we don't have a safe planet. But we have an energy system that has been built up on fossil fuels for 239 years since James Watt put out his steam engine in 1776. Great invention, made the modern world and is now uh, wrecking it if we don't do something about it. So we have to move to an energy transition. That's one huge, huge, huge challenge. But this one of how to feed the planet in a sustainable way is right up there. And it's really complicated. And it's complicated for all the reasons that all of the brilliant people who are leaders in their field have spoke about but I wanted to add one thing that I didn't hear enough of during the day. First, of course, we have massive malnutrition because you have, as every, many people have said, a billion people who are deeply hungry and another billion who are chronically uh, malnourished with uh, micronutrient deficiency and another billion who are uh, obese or nearly obese and with very bad diets, oh, I'm out of time, and so is the planet, but I'm gonna continue for just two, for just two minutes. Uh, so you have big malnutrition, and you'd like to make sure everybody can eat. Then you look around and you say, oh my God, but the farm sector, the way it's done right now is the number one anthropogenic driver of all this dangerous change. Even the greenhouse gases, if you add up CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, plus the habitat destruction, the water stress, all the rest, 
the overfishing and so forth, biggest anthropogenic driver, that would be enough of a problem. How do you produce enough food for everybody, healthy food, and in a sustainable way? But then what I didn't hear enough about is how the environmental change that's already underway is clobbering the food system that we have right now. So even hanging on to what we produce in a world of more droughts, more floods, more heat waves, is going to be very, very challenging. So this is an extremely complex agenda because the food supply has to meet real needs of people for healthy diets. Part of that is our own behavior, but part of it is food system and agricultural production. The food system has to stop wrecking the habitat through deforestation and water uh, over abstraction and so forth. And the food system has to be resilient to the environmental stresses that are inevitable even if we get our act together to mitigate the worst of what could happen. So that's a very, very large agenda. And what's the challenge of EAT in this? The challenge is no government can do it itself. No government has the capacity to do it. The agenda is so interconnected that there is absolutely no agency charged with this, with integrating nutrition, health, environment, resiliency. There is no body of uh, organized uh, effort to make SDG2, which is basically end hunger and achieve sustainable agriculture and ensure nutrition for all, there does not exist an organized effort to do it. So I view EAT as the unique opportunity to build the community to make this happen. Not that EAT can do it itself and everybody's stressed. This is so complicated. There are millions, literally billions of actors, but millions of important actors and thousands of apex actors in this. But they will not be able to do this unless there's intellectual structure, data, strategy, vision, motivation, high leadership getting together, building that effort together. It doesn't exist right now. We've watched in various areas during the MDGs how this can be built. For example, how you can build a community to fight AIDS or to control malaria. But I have to say, Gunhild, this one's harder. It's more interconnected. It, it is more embracing, more holistic. There isn't one pill that solves a problem because agriculture is local, inevitably. It's climate and soil, and topographically based, culturally based. But ladies and gentlemen, we don't get to choose the problems. The problems choose us. And this one, we've got to accept. Thanks.